Dr. Ken Lando, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Zyrem. Zyrem is a drug used to treat narcolepsy. Now, there have been some disease awareness campaigns on the television recently. They say if you go to a site known as morethantired.com, you'll learn about narcolepsy and you have the opportunity to look at a questionnaire. Questionnaire that might indicate if you possibly are suffering from narcolepsy. And let me tell you, if you take the test, chances are you will need to go and see a doctor. The target of these ads? Well, potential sufferers of the disease and doctors because the company did a survey, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and what they discovered was that people have heard about narcolepsy, but for the most part, their understanding of the disease is very limited, and doctors aren't really comfortable making the diagnosis or writing a prescription. Well, what is Xyrem? Xyrem, the active ingredient, is actually the sodium salt of GHB. That's GABA hydroxybutyrate. That's the date rape drug. It's a Schedule I drug. It's considered a drug that has a significant chance of misuse or abuse and by itself has no legitimate medical purposes. But sodium oxybate, the sodium derivative of that date rape drug, well, that's considered a Schedule three drug, basically the same thing as Tylenol and codeine or testosterone. Well, in 2002, the Food and Drug Administration gave the okay to market this drug for the excessive daytime sleepiness or cataplexy that was associated with narcolepsy, but it has a black box warning on the label. That means that there are some severe hazards. What are the severe hazards? Central nervous system depression, misuse and abuse, respiratory depression, and it's only available through one pharmacy in the country. Now, for some reason, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine says this drug is the standard of care for people who have excessive daytime sleepiness associated with narcolepsy or who have cataplexy. If you take the drug, you're going to have some side effects. We find that around one person in five suffers from nausea, about 10 to 15 percent of the people taking the drug are going to suffer from dizziness, vomiting in about 10 percent, going to feel tired, and interestingly, somewhere around 1 in 14 people are going to start wetting their bed, tremors are frequent to develop, and about 10 percent of the people stop the medicine because of side effects. Now those are the minor side effects. Let's go on and talk about some of the more major side effects, which include neuropsychiatric syndromes, like hallucinations and psychosis and agitation and aggression and thought disorder, behavioral abnormalities, and you start walking in your sleep again. And then, even worse, you can have slow breathing and trouble breathing and change in alertness. There are seizures and coma and even death associated with this medicine. And if you take the medicine, you better not drink any alcohol. And if you take the drug, you better not take a sleeping pill. And even at the recommended doses, it can lead to obtundation and respiratory depression. And that's even if you're taking a stimulant. And it can lead to respiratory depression, profound sedation, and it can lead to death if you combine it with a benzodiazepine, a anxiety medicine, Xanax, lorazepam, something of that nature. Or if you happen to go to the dentist and you have a tooth filling, well, doctor might give you some hydrocodone. You take the hydrocodone, and if you combine it with the Xyrem, it could knock you off. Same with the sedating antidepressant drugs or the antipsychotics or the muscle relaxants and a lot of the illicit drugs that people take nowadays. And there's a warning on the drug. It contains an awful lot of sodium. And in fact, the low dose, six grams a day, that has 1,100 milligrams of sodium, that's almost your entire daily allotment of sodium. And if you take the more common 9 gram dose, that has all of the sodium you're supposed to take during the course of any day, which means that it can lead to hypertension or people with hypertension get further out of control, cause congestive heart failure, end up in renal disease. Sleepwalking we mentioned, there's anxiety, confusion, depression, suicidality. You have to be very careful taking a drug that might be an antidepressant. 
and you have to be very careful of doing anything six hours after you take the last dose of the medicine because it might impair your ability to think or to drive. And if you combine it with alcohol, remember, this is the date rate drug, basically, and it can lead to amnesia. Well, if there's anything good, most people who have narcolepsy tend to be a little bit heavy. And this drug seems to be associated oftentimes with weight loss. You should take the drug at bedtime, obviously. You don't take it within two hours of eating because fatty food's going to delay the absorption. The starting dose is four and a half grams. But now listen to this. You take four and a half grams, but you have to divide it into two doses. You take the drug, you mix it. You have to add some water to it. It's a liquid. So you divide it into two small canisters. You add the water. You get into bed, and then you take the first dose. You take the first dose while you're in bed because even without feeling tired, this drug can make you plop down, you fall asleep. Oftentimes within five minutes, generally within 15 minutes of taking the drug, even without feeling drowsy. And then you have to set an alarm clock, even though you've just taken a central nervous system depressant, you have to set an alarm clock for two and a half to four hours after you take the dose so that you can wake up and take another dose, your second dose of the medicine. Once you mix it, you have to take it within 24 hours so you don't mix a whole lot. You slowly increase the dose from that four and a half grams up to nine grams. The medicine's only filled in one central pharmacy here in the United States because of what's known as the Xyrem, that's the name of the drug, REMS, R-E-M-S, that's a program that the FDA has started, and it's called the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies. The FDA does this for drugs where there's potential for some toxicity. So what happens with this REMS is you have to have the doctor fax the prescription to that central pharmacy, the certified pharmacy. Once they receive it, they'll have a nurse call you. The nurse first inquires about the insurance and then answers any questions you might have about the drug. If everything's okay, then the nurse has the pharmacist call you. The pharmacist goes over the medicines that you might be taking, reviews the side effects, and then if everything's okay with the pharmacist, then the, mess, the, the drug will be sent to you and you have to sign for the drug. Remember, it's a central nervous system depressant, so how well does it work? Well. On this Epworth score, that's a sleep score that you can take on the site, tired no more, if you look at people who are in the baseline, it doesn't seem to change if you take a placebo. It falls a little bit, the score falls a little bit, just a little bit. If you take the 6 gram, it falls a smidgen more if you take the 9 gram. But even if you take the 9 gram, the score on the test still indicates that you have a significant problem. And in trials, even looking at 80% of the people taking a stimulant, you find if we're talking about cataplexy, at the dose of six grams an evening, people still have about two attacks of cataplexy a day. If we increase it to nine grams a day, then the attack rate of cataplexy might fall to one attack a day. Placebo, it's about two attacks a day. So we still have the cataplexy. You still are tired and you still have cataplexy. Well, What's the global impression? The global impression is that there's some improvement taking the drug, and the higher the dose, the better it seems to be. Now, if we look at people who are taking a drug to help with sleepiness, help with narcolepsy, it's known as modafinil. Baseline, the people have about 10 minutes when they can stay awake in a quiet, darkened room. If they happen to take a placebo instead of that drug, it falls to about seven minutes. On the other hand, if they take the modafinil, they started off at about 10 minutes being able to stay awake, and now we add the Xyrem and we go up to the full dose at 9 grams, the people can stay awake only for about 13 minutes. So we haven't really done a whole lot with this drug. Now, the normal sleep is different kinds of stages. You have four or six sleep cycles per night, the average person. And a sleep cycle tends to be about 100 minutes. The non-REM sleep, is going to be about 80 to 90 or even 100 minutes of that time period. That's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, delta sleep, all of that. And the REM sleep, that lasts for about less than 30 minutes. There's an increase in brain activity in the REM sleep, and that's associated with temporary paralysis of the muscles 
that control your posture and with vivid dreams. Remember that. REM sleep is associated with paralysis of the muscles that control your posture and your movement and vivid dreams. Okay. So the insurance companies, they want to make sure that you really need the drugs. So the insurance companies are going to see that you've taken other drugs than modafinil or Nuvigil or methylphenidate or dextroamphetamine or something like that, or you're unable to tolerate those medicines before they'll let you take Xyrem. Why? Because Xyrem is expensive. They've raised the price about a thousand percent, not a hundred percent, a thousand percent since 2006. And as a matter of fact, in 2014, it led all of the drugs in the country as far as the increase in price. How much does a drug cost? Listen to this. This is stupid. I mean, flat out ridiculous. This drug costs in excess of $12,000 a month or about $150,000 a year. It costs a excess, in excess of $400 a day to take the medicine. And the company wants to use the medicine for other potential problems. They tried to get the FDA to look at it for chronic fatigue syndrome, but 12 million people suffer from chronic fatigue syndrome here in the United States, or so it says. And as a result, they really can't keep their thumb on this medicine. And remember, it's basically the date rape drug. Other things, well, it's, the company would like to consider it for Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, binge eating disorders, essential tremor, and movement disorders, and even chronic cluster headaches. Well, the other drugs that we have that are not FDA approved for the purpose, but are readily available, often work very well. Those are the drugs we talked about, the Nuvigil, the Modafinil, the methylphenidate, that's Ritalin that the kids take with hyperactivity, or the amphetamines, dextroamphetamine, tricyclic antidepressant, the old-fashioned antidepressants, or the newer antidepressants, we call them the SSRIs, those are drugs like Prozac, or Paxil, or Zoloft, or Lexapro, and even some of the newer drugs like Gefexor, they seem to work relatively well. Now, what do we know about narcolepsy? Narcolepsy is a condition that has four major subdivisions. And it all has to do with poor control of the sleep-wake cycle. So what's the, how do we make the diagnosis? Well, excessive daytime sleepiness. So you have the sudden irresistible urge to fall asleep. Can last anywhere between several seconds and several minutes. And then we have cataplexy, the sudden loss in control of those voluntary muscles that control your posture. That's like REM sleep, isn't it? And the vivid dreams. And those vivid dreams have hallucinations, and they're typically visual hallucinations. And then either when you're falling asleep or when you're waking up, you can have some paralysis, temporary paralysis, of course, seconds to minutes. And then you have some poor sleep quality and frequent waking during the evening. Well, only 10 to 20, 25 percent of the people have all of those four major symptoms. Now, let's talk about the major symptoms. Excessive daytime sleepiness. Well, it's under-recognized and under-diagnosed. This is the irresistible desire to fall asleep. It's during the day. It happens every day. It's during activities, especially, that don't require a lot of participation. So watching the television. It even can happen when you're talking with somebody. And excessive daytime sleepiness, you can imagine, if you fall asleep right away, that can be very serious if you're walking, if you're working, if you're driving a car, or if you're climbing up steps, associated with several naps during the day. But the naps don't seem to be refreshing, except for about an hour or so. People who have excessive daytime sleepiness often suffer from a sense of mental cloudiness, or a lack of energy, or depression, or memory lapses, difficulty concentrating. And 40% of the people, so almost half of the people, have what we call automatic behaviors, or micro-sleep, that occurs for a few seconds, and it's occurring during activities that are normally performed. So, for instance, when you're taking notes. You continue taking notes, but you're really not there, and the notes aren't nearly as accurate as they would be if you didn't have these automatic behaviors. Or the same thing with typing. You have the deterioration. Well, excessive daytime sleepiness has a variety of causes, as you can imagine. Maybe you have some sleep difficulties or sleep deprivation, or maybe you have depression or congestive heart failure, a variety of infections or obstructive sleep apnea. Maybe you're drinking too much caffeine, too much alcohol, or smoking too much 
nicotine. And we generally find in people with narcolepsy that as soon as they fall asleep, they go into the REM cycle. Remember, you usually go stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and then after anywhere between 80 and 100 minutes, then you fall into the REM sleep. But in people with narcolepsy, you fall into the REM sleep right away. But that's not just with narcolepsy. You also could have it with some irregular work cycles. So when you have to stay awake for peculiar periods of time or maybe have disrupted sleep or maybe you're taking certain medicines, maybe again you have the obstructive sleep apnea. And then we have cataplexy. It's usually associated with narcolepsy. It could be mild, maybe just a little sagging of your jaw, maybe some drooping of an eyelid or head dropping maybe some slurred speech, maybe just some buckling of your knee when you're walking, or it could be severe. You could lose control of all voluntary muscles and just fall to the floor. Even though you're awake, you fall to the ground. Well, obviously, that significant problem, if you're driving a car or if you're doing something that might hurt others, usually lasts for several seconds to several minutes, usually the cataplexy begins after the narcolepsy. If it doesn't, if it becomes apparent first, then people think you had a seizure. Well, you also can develop some hallucinations. They're a major component of this condition. And the hallucinations tend to occur either when you're falling asleep or when you're waking up. We call them hypnagogic or hypnopompic hallucinations. They can occur with the sleep paralysis that we mentioned a moment ago. You have vivid, seemingly real and frightening, typically visual hallucinations or you have sleep paralysis. You can't move either while you're falling asleep or while you're waking up. Temporary inability to speak, to move, and that's because you're really in the REM sleep. It's exactly like the REM sleep. It lasts for several seconds to several moments and you're fully conscious during this time. Now, people who have narcolepsy don't sleep more in any 24-hour period than people who don't. It's as common in men as it is in women, and typically it occurs, at least starts, in adolescence. It's thought that in the United States there are probably only somewhere around 12,000, 13,000 people with narcolepsy. It often begins during puberty, often triggered by an upper respiratory infection that you develop in the winter, and then the onset of the disease is in the spring or the early summer. It's frequently associated with an increase in the ASO titer, that means you might have had a streptococcal infection, it's associated with low concentrations in the blood of a chemical known as hypocretin. Hypocretin is necessary for wakefulness. That 10% of the time it's familial, somebody else in the family has it, but 90% of the time it's just a sporadic condition. Nobody has it. It's thought to be maybe an autoimmune disorder. It's not a mutation in any gene, but for some reason, it seems that people with this condition lose the number of cells in the brain that secrete this chemical known as hypocretin. Well, it also, hypocretin, seems to regulate appetite and weight, and people who have narcolepsy tend to be heavier than people who don't. Now, the company, in order to keep the price high, in order to keep its lock on the condition, their lobbying expenses went from $10,000 in 2011 to more recently, just last year, over half a million dollars. Now, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, that's the name of the drug, the company that manufactures it, they purchased a small company in Ireland known as Azer Pharmaceuticals, and they relocated the headquarters. So not only are they charging people here in America enormous amounts of money, but they're escaping a lot of United States taxes. And interestingly enough, when there's always a, a, a bad scent around, well, Valiant Pharmaceuticals from Canada, they sell the drug in Canada for Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Well, Jazz Pharmaceuticals purchased the right, purchased the ownership of a variety of drugs, including Xyrem, back in 2005. They purchased it for $150 million. Now remember the sales of this drug are well in excess of a billion dollars a year. They're making considerably more than $500 million in profit per year for a drug that they spent $150 million on. 
So why the price raises? What's the cause of all of that nonsense? And why is the government, why are the insurance companies going along with it? And as a matter of fact, in 2007, Jazz Pharmaceuticals pleaded guilty to felony charges that they marketed the drug for unapproved uses. They sponsored events for doctors, they had unrestricted grants to doctors who wrote prescriptions, and they paid fees to doctors for off-label use. They paid the speaker fees. Well, the FDA actually warned them that they didn't report some serious side effects, including about 10 deaths in the interval between 2003 and 2010. So my take on the drug is it's very expensive. Remember, we're talking about a drug that might cost as much as about $150,000 a year, but you don't have to worry because they'll give you a card and the overwhelming majority of people pay less than $50 and about half of the people, or 40% of the people, are going to pay less than $25. So you're immunized against the real cost of this ridiculous kind of uh, medicine. It has mixed reviews. Some people say it works okay, but it doesn't work all that great. There are alternatives around. And remember, in this drug, we're talking about Xyrem. It is basically the date rape drug. So $140,000 a year, $150,000 a year? Give me a break. Anyway, I'm Dr. Ken Landau, and thank you for watching.